Hello students and welcome to Scholar, your one-stop solution to UPSC preparation. I am Shabhangi Sharma, your faculty for history and this particular module is based on the NCERTs of history. Now students, NCERTs are a very important part with respect to the UPSC syllabus. Hence, this particular module is aiming to give you a better insight with respect to the NCERTs wherein you can first go through these videos and then correlate them with the chapters for a thorough understanding. So let's begin. Now students, in our last lecture, we had spoken about the important instruments of accession that were used by the East India Company to acquire territories in our country, such as the subsidiary alliance, the paramount sea policy, etc. Apart from the students, we had also understood how the company was successful in attacking important regional kingdoms such as the Marathas and Mysore and ultimately take over their administration. So students, this particular lecture is also in continuation to the chapter 2 that is from trade to territory wherein now we are going to talk about another important instrument of accession that is the doctrine of lapse. Now here in students, we must know that this doctrine of lapse was given forward by Lord Dalhousie who had served as the Governor General from 1848 to 1856. Now, under this particular policy, students, it was declared that if any Indian ruler had died without a male heir, then their kingdom would lapse and become a part of the company's territory. Herein, it will be important to note, students, that the adopted heir was not considered as the legal or uh, legal successor of any particular territory. It has to be a natural born heir. And since many rulers died without natural heirs, naturally a lot of territory came under the hands of the East India Company. Apart from the spoons, it will be important to note that the states that were annexed as part of the doctrine of lapse include Satara in 1848, Sambalpur in 1850, Udaipur in 1852, Nagpur in 1853 and Jhansi in 1854. Of prominence here students is the state of Awadh which was annexed in the year 1856. Now it is important because this particular state was annexed on very bitter terms wherein the East India Company declared that the Nawab of Awadh was misgoverning and his policies were not at all good for the citizens of that particular area. And because of this, the Nawab felt really humiliated and thus in the year 1857, he took part in the revolt of 1857. So with this, we have understood the instrument of accession that is the doctrine of lapse given by Lord Dalhousie. So students, these were the major instruments of accession such as the subsidiary alliance, the paramount sea policy, doctrine of lapse and putting a British resident in a particular territory. Now let us understand, uh, sorry, as a part of these policies, we have understood that a lot of uh, King, a lot of territory had come under the hands of the British East India Company. So let us understand that what were the prominent results of these policies with respect to the territory acquisition of the East India Company in India. So students by 1857 as a part of these policies, the company was successful in directly ruling over 63% of the territory in our country and also 78% of the total population of the Indian subcontinent. Here in students in this particular task, the company was also helped by the arrival of a new stream technology in the early 19th century because students earlier in order to reach to India from normal ships it took a very long time particularly months however with the arrival of steamships the journey from England to India was reduced as low to as low as three weeks and now the presence of Britishers was much more prominent along with their families who were migrating to India. Now students, with this we have understood the important instruments of accession and the expansionist policies of the East India Company. Now we are going to move a step further and we are going to understand the administrative changes that were put forward by the East India Company as a part of their rule till 1857. Now students, the most important aspect of East India Company's administration were the administrative units that were known as presidencies, which were the British territories in India. 
here in students the most important were three presidencies that is the bengal madras and bombay presidency it will be important to note that each of these presidency was ruled by a governor now there was a supreme head above these three governors who was also the head of the administration and he was known as the governor general now here in students it will be important to note that warren hastings was the first governor general of these three presidencies who had served a time period between 1773 to 1785 apart from the students there were very important innovations that were done as a part of the term of warren hastings particularly in the sphere of justice where in students from the year 1772 a new system of justice was devised and each district had two courts with respect to the proper dispersal of justice now every district had two courts that is a criminal court and a civil court and the criminal court herein was known as the faujdari adalat and the civil court was known as the diwani adalat apart from the students herein it will be very important to note then in our that in our country there were two types of legal systems that were going on that is one which was owned by the hindus and one which was owned by the muslims or the maulvis now the hindu type of law uh, dispersion or law administration was based on the schools of dharma shastras whereas the maulvis interpreted their laws according to the islamic texts here in students also it will be important to note that the criminal courts were still under the supervision of the qazis and muftis but they were also under the supervision of collectors now let us understand what do we mean by qazi mufti and a collector now students a qazi was basically a judge who was responsible for administering the law on the other hand students mufti was a jurist of the muslim community and his task was to explain the law now both of these terms are pertaining to the muslims and that is why we can see that the criminal courts were under the supervision that was administered by the muslim law which was in turn under the supervision of collectors now these collectors basically were the principal figures in any particular indian district who were responsible for collecting revenue and taxes and they were also maintaining the law and order in any particular district with the help of these judges or qazis police officers and the darogas who were responsible for the local administration in any particular district so students till now we have understood how in india there were two streams of law that were going on one which was dominated by the muslims and one which was dominated by the hindus and this caused a lot of chaos with respect to a universal or uniform disposition of justice in our country and in order to reckon with such kind of problem uniformity was uh, uh, was brought about by the english east india company in 1775 wherein first 11 pandits were asked to compile a digest of hindu laws which was translated into english by a person known as n b hall head apart from the students even a unified system of muslim laws that is a code of muslim laws was created in 1778 and this was compiled for the benefit of european judges so now we can see since the justice administration was something that came into the hands of the english east india company and it was dominated by the european judges so in order to solve the problem of chaos or non uniformity important codified laws with respect to hindu laws and muslim laws were brought about and this gave a sense of uniformity in the dispersion of justice apart from the students under the regulating act of 1773 a new supreme court was established in our country also a court of appeal that is known as the sadar nizamat adalat was set up in calcutta now what were other important aspects of regulating act of 1773 is something that we are going to talk about in further chapters right now you just need to know that under this act of 1773 a supreme court and a court of appeal were set up in calcutta 
Now students, apart from the administration, a lot of changes were also conducted with respect to the army in our country. Now before understanding these changes, let us first understand that what, how the army was like during the Mughal time period. So basically the Mughal army was mainly comprising of two types of soldiers, that is the cavalry soldiers who were sitting on the horseback and the infantry soldiers who were also known as the pedal or foot soldiers. Apart from the students during the Mughal times, these particular soldiers were given training in archery or tir andazi and the use of sword or talwar. However, students after the decline of Mughal empire and the rise of successor states such as Awadh and Banaras, an important change of recruiting pe peasants and training them into professional soldiers was something that was started and this similar policy was put uh, was taken up by the English East India Company who created their own Sepoy army. Herein by Sepoy we mean soldier. Apart from the students, once the East India Company was successful in diminishing all the regional states and at the same time they had started expanding or started fighting with territories that were outside India such as Burma, Afghanistan and Egypt, a new problem came in front of them that is the soldiers of these particular areas were armed with other kind of weapons such as muskets and matchlocks. Now here in students by muskets we mean a heavy gun and this heavy gun was operated by the infantry soldiers or the pedal soldiers. By matchlocks we mean a type of an early gun and here in the gunpowder was ignited with a matchstick hence the term matchlocks. So you can see since such kind of weapons were operated by infantry or pedal soldiers the prominence of cavalry declined in the early 19th century and infantry became more prominent. Also students during the early 19th century the Britishers began the practice of creating a uniform military culture and European style of training, drill and discipline was given to the Indian soldiers. However students this kind of discipline created a lot of problems with respect to the Indian soldiers as their feelings with respect to caste and community were ignored. Herein I would like to tell you one most important point that this particular ignorance of the caste and community feelings of the Indian soldiers was one of the most important reasons for the revolt of 1857 about which we are going to talk about in further lectures. Now students with this we have completed our discussion on the entire chapter of from trade to territory. Let's take a quick recap of what we have studied in this particular chapter. So we have started the first doctrine of laps which was a subsidiary alliance paramount C ki hi, ek instrument of accession which was the East India Company India ke bahut sare states ko annex karne mein successful hui. ये डॉक्ट्रिन ऑफ लैप्स डेलहाउजी ने पुट फॉरवर्ड किया था जिसके अंदर अगर कोई भी स्टेट का रूलर मर जाता है और उसका कोई नेचुरल बोर्न सन या एयर नहीं होता है तो वो किंगडम लैप्स हो जाएगा और वो ऑटोमेटिकली कंपनी की टेरिटरी का पार्ट हो जाएगा इस डॉक्ट्रिन ऑफ लैप्स के जो टर्म्स थे उसके द्वारा बहुत सारे स्टेट्स ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी के अंडर आ गए जैसे कि सतारा संबलपुर झांसी अवध एटसेट्रा Apart from the students, we have seen that what are the important results in instruments of accession. So, the most important part was that in 1857, India ka karibun 63% territory East India Company ke direct rule ke under and around 78% of the population bhi East India Company ke direct supervision ke under. Aa उसके अलावा स्टूडेंट्स हमने ये समझा था कि स्टीम टेक्नोलॉजी जो कि अर्ली 19th सेंचुरी में डेवलप हो गई थी वो बहुत ही हेल्पफुल रही ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी के लिए अपना एक्सपेंशन करने के लिए क्योंकि पहले ब्रिटिशर्स को इंडिया आने में महीनों का टाइम लगता था लेकिन अब स्टीम टेक्नोलॉजी की वजह से जो स्टीम शिप्स बन गए थे उससे वो इंडिया 3 वीक के अंदर-अंदर आ सकते थे जिससे कि ब्रिटिशर्स की पॉपुलेशन इंडिया में बढ़ती चली गई उसके अलावा स्टूडेंट्स हमने समझा था कि ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी के अंडर इंडिया का एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन किस तरह से हुआ जिसमें सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट पार्ट था प्रेसिडेंसीज जो कि ब्रिटिश टेरिटरीज थी और एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव यूनिट्स थी ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी के अंडर 
सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट तीन प्रेसिडेंसी थी बेंगाल मद्रास एंड बॉम्बे जो कि गवर्नर्स के द्वारा रूल करी जाती थी इन गवर्नर्स के ऊपर एक सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट पर्सन था जिसे बोलते थे गवर्नर जनरल जो कि इन सब का सुप्रीम हेड था नाउ इंडिया में सबसे पहला गवर्नर जनरल था वॉरन हेस्टिंग्स और वो अपने एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव रिफॉर्म्स पर्टिकुलरली जस्टिस के एरिया में जो एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव रिफॉर्म्स किए थे उसके लिए बहुत ही जाना जाता था उसके बाद में स्टूडेंट्स हमने ये समझा था कि कैसे इंडिया का हर डिस्ट्रिक्ट दो कोर्ट्स में डिवाइड कर दिया गया था जो कि है क्रिमिनल कोर्ट और सिविल कोर्ट और ये वॉरन हेस्टिंग्स के कार्यकाल के अंडर हुआ था फिर स्टूडेंट्स हमने समझा था कि इंडिया के अंदर एक प्रॉब्लम थी जस्टिस को लेके जो कि ये थी कि हिंदूज अपना लॉ अपनी तरह से इंटरप्रेट करते थे अपनी टेक्स के बेसिस पे जो कि थी धर्मशास्त्र और मुस्लिम मॉलवीज जो थे वो अपनी तरह से अपने लॉ को इंटरप्रेट करते थे और इसलिए एक यूनिफॉर्म जस्टिस सिस्टम नहीं था हमारी कंट्री के अंदर और इसीलिए एक यूनिफॉर्मिटी लाने के लिए ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी ने 1775 में एक पहला हिंदू लॉज का कंपाइलेशन किया और फिर 1778 में एक मुस्लिम लॉज का कंपाइलेशन किया और ये दोनों बनने के बाद एक तरह से एक यूनिफॉर्मिटी आ गई जस्टिस डिस्पर्स करने में कंट्री के अंदर उसके अलावा स्टूडेंट्स हमने ये समझा था कि एक एक्ट थी दैट इज रेगुलेटिंग एक्ट ऑफ 1773 जिसके अंडर इंडिया में सुप्रीम कोर्ट स्टैब्लिश हुआ कैलकाटा में और एक कोर्ट ऑफ अपील भी स्टैब्लिश हुई उसके अलावा स्टूडेंट्स हमने एक और एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव पर्सन के बारे में पढ़ा था जो कि है कलेक्टर जिसके अंडर सारे कोर्ट्स आया करते थे और वो ही और वो इंडियन डिस्ट्रिक्ट में बहुत ही प्रोमिनेंट था और उसका जो मेन रोल था वो था टैक्स और रेवेन्यू का कलेक्शन करना और लॉ को लॉ एंड ऑर्डर एक डिस्ट्रिक्ट में संभाल के रखना अपार्ट फ्रॉम दिस हमने ये समझा था कि एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन के अलावा आर्मी में किस तरह से चेंजेस आए ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी के टाइम पे उसको समझने के लिए हमने पहले मुगल आर्मी के बारे में समझा जिसमें दो टाइप के सोल्जर्स बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट थे इन्फेंट्री यानी कि पैदल सेना और कैवलरी यानी कि घुड़सवार सैनी जो घुड़सवार सोल्जर्स थे ये हमने समझा लेकिन स्टूडेंट्स हमने ये भी साथ में देखा कि जैसे ही मुगल एम्पायर डिक्लाइन हुआ और रीजनल स्टेट्स आगे आए जैसे कि अवध और बनारस उन्होंने एक नए तरीके से आर्मी को बनाना शुरू किया जिसमें उन्होंने लोकल पेजेंट्स पेजेंट्स यानी कि जो हमारे नॉर्मल विलेजर्स हुए उनको आर्मी में रिक्रूट करना शुरू किया और उनको ट्रेनिंग दी प्रोफेशनल सोल्जर्स बनने के लिए यही सेम तरीका ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी ने भी अपनाया और अपनी खुद की एक सेपॉय आर्मी बनाई सेपॉय का मतलब होता है सोल्जर लेकिन स्टूडेंट्स जैसे ही ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी ने अपना एक्सपेंशन थोड़े नॉर्थ वेस्ट साइड की जगह में या फिर इंडिया के बाहर की कंट्रीज में जब उनको कोई वॉर करना पड़ता था वहां पर किया जैसे कि बर्मा अफगानिस्तान या इजिप्ट में उनके सामने एक नई प्रॉब्लम आई वो नई प्रॉब्लम ये थी कि इन देशों के अंदर जिस तरह से सोल्जर्स लड़ते थे वो अलग तरह के वेपन्स यूज करते थे जो कि इंडियन आर्मी के पास नहीं थे जैसे कि मस्किट्स और मैचलॉक्स जो कि दोनों ही एक तरह की गन या बंदूक होती है और वो ज्यादातर पैदल सेना के द्वारा यूज की जाती है अब क्योंकि पैदल सेना यानी कि इन्फेंट्री इतनी इंपॉर्टेंट हो गई थी तो नेचुरली कैवलरी यानी कि घुड़सवार सैनिक जो थे उनकी इंपॉर्टेंस खत्म हो गई ऑल्सो स्टूडेंट्स जैसे ही अर्ली नाइनटीन सेंचुरी आने लगी यानी कि स्टार्टिंग एटीन आने लगे तो यूरोप ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी ने एक यूनिफॉर्म तरीके का मिलिट्री कल्चर इंडिया में इंट्रोड्यूस किया जहां पे सारे इंडियन सैनिक्स को एक बहुत ही स्ट्रिक्ट और डिसिप्लिन मैनर में अपनी ट्रेनिंग लेनी पड़ती थी और इसकी वजह से उनके कास्ट और कम्युनिटी सेंटिमेंट्स के ऊपर ध्यान नहीं दिया जाता था जिसकी वजह से वो बहुत नाराज हुए और ये एक बहुत बड़ा कारण बना आगे जाके रिवोल्ट ऑफ एटीन में स्टूडेंट्स so इसके साथ हमने अपना फ्रॉम ट्रेड टू टेरिटरी वाले चैप्टर को कम्प्लीटली और थरली डिस्कस कर लिया है नाउ वी आर गोइंग टू अटेम्प्ट टू प्रैक्टिस एमसीक्यूज ऑन व्हाट वी हैव लर्न फ्रॉम दिस पर्टिकुलर चैप्टर नाउ इन द स्टूडेंट्स द फर्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज पर्टेनिंग टू थ्री इंपॉर्टेंट स्टेटमेंट एंड हियर इन वी नीड टू आइडेंटिफाई दैट विच अमंग देम आर इन Now, students, the first statement says that under the subsidiary alliance, a British resident was stationed in any particular state. Now, as we know, students, subsidiary alliance is pertaining to an army, British army unit that needs to be put in any particular territory, and that territory is responsible for paying for that particular British army that is stationed in their area. 
and uh, if they are unable to pay that particular amount that territory will be annexed by the east india company all on the other hand the concept of british resident is absolutely different wherein a british resident was put in the court of any particular territory and he used to meddle with the administrative affairs of that particular area so we can see both the concepts are different and hence this statement is going to be incorrect Now, students, the second statement says that the Second Anglo-Maratha War resulted in the Treaty of Salabai. Now, students, this statement is again going to be incorrect as it was not the Second Anglo-Maratha War; rather, it was the First Anglo-Maratha War that had culminated into the Treaty of Salabai. Now, students, the third statement says that Tipu Sultan modernized his army with the help of French. Now this statement is going to be correct because we had understood that Tipu Sultan had friendly relations with the French, which was irksome to the British East India Company, and hence there were four Anglo Anglo Mysore wars between these two parties. So this statement is going to be correct. So students, herein we can see that the first and second statement are incorrect, and therefore our final answer for this question is going to be option A. Now let's move on to the second question. Now, students, this particular question contains names of four Indian states, and we need to arrange them in a correct chronological manner under which they were annexed as a part of the doctrine of lapse. Now, doctrine of lapse, as we had just studied, was put forward by Lord Dalhousie, wherein, in the absence of any natural heir, any particular Indian territory will directly fall into the hands of the East India Company. Also, students, we had understood the different years in which these states were annexed. Wherein Awadh was annexed in 1846, Jhansi, on the other hand, was annexed in 1854, Satara was annexed in 1848, and students, Udaipur was annexed in 1852. Herein, I have done a mistake. Uh, Awadh was not annexed in 1846; it was annexed in 1856. So from this we can easily identify that the correct chronological sequence will be option C that is Satara Udaipur then Jhansi and then Awadh and hence our final answer for this particular question is going to be option C So students I hope you have understood all these topics thoroughly if you like our content please visit scholar.com for more thank you